Hi everyone, I just want to say sorry for putting you through even more Shakespeare, but these um, couple of videos are meant to help you better understand what he was talking about when uh, he wrote Henry V. These movies are, one of them will be like a background thing and tell you what happened before the story in, a, in a, as much as a simplistic way as possible um, so that you don't um, kill me in the street. Okay, bye. Alright, so our story begins with a young king. He's actually a bit too immature to be ruling a country. Oh, but not immature like farts and yo mama jokes. He just never seems to make the right decisions. His name is King Richard. Oh, the second. Now Rich loved being king. He thought it was his divine right to rule over those peasant dogs. But the thing is, he taxed them too much. And the money he did get went straight to Ireland to fund his wars. So as you can imagine, this didn't make him very popular. The play begins with two feuding noblemen who want the king to settle their dispute. The first is Thomas Mowbray, and the second is Henry Bolingbroke, who's actually the cousin of the king. Both men claim that the other has committed treason against the crown. But instead of trying to find out the facts, he just makes them have a duel, and whoever wins, that must be the person who wasn't guilty. Then, he changes his mind, and says, For that our kingdom's earth should not be soiled with that dear blood which it hath fostered, and for our eyes do hate the dire aspect of civil wounds plowed up with neighbors' swords. So to avoid this, he decides to banish them. Both. The really unfair thing is that Thomas Mowbray gets a lifetime sentence, whereas Henry Bolingbroke only gets six years. I guess it really pays off to be related to royalty. Now because of this, you don't need to worry about Thomas Mowbray anymore. He pretty much just dies in exile. But Henry Bolingbroke, he's very important. Now though, he's leaving England in search of a new home. And now let me introduce you to Sir John of Gaunt. His son is Henry Bolingbroke. And he sees that the king banishes Henry and says to himself, but I'm going to be dead in six years. Why does my son have to leave even if he wasn't proven guilty? And soon enough, a little while after Henry is banished, he does die. But not before he can scold the king for renting out plots of English land to wealthy noblemen just to raise money for his war in Ireland. Landlord of England art thou now, not king. Then he curses Richard and says, Live in thy shame, but die not shame with thee. And I don't know if you've noticed, but curses that come from the dying or wronged in Shakespeare's plays tend to actually come true. For example, Mercutio's dying words in Romeo and Juliet were, A play go both your houses. And that one actually came true, as you well know. After his speech, John of Gaunt dies. And then Richard kind of looks around and says to himself, Hey, look at that golden cup. Look at that awesome candle. Well, shut up, it's a candle. And since John of Gaunt was so rich, Richard decides to take all of his possessions and send the money to his soldiers in Ireland. Far away in some distant land, Henry hears what King Richard has done, and even though he's in exile, he comes back to reclaim what's his. And most of the nobles of the land are actually behind him because they're pretty tired of Richard's horrible reign. This is not good news for the king. To defend himself, he goes to Ireland to find an army. But the problem is, there are nomadic people who don't wait long enough for the king to arrive. So by the time he gets there, they're gone. Meanwhile, Henry has done some recruiting of his own. Now, all of the noblemen of England are behind him, and Richard is left only with his closest advisors to defend him. And soon, the day came the king had been dreading when Henry and his men stormed the castle. Richard, realizing he was beaten, shamefully and hopelessly gives up his crown and his kingdom. John of Gaunt's curse had reached reality. The next time Richard goes into his beloved throne room, he's in a coffin. He had been murdered, and his cousin Henry Bolingbroke had taken his place as King Henry IV of England.
Henry IV picks up many years later. The king is old, tired, and has a rebellion on his hands. This upheaval is led by Harry Percy, nicknamed Hotspur, and he poses a growing threat to Henry's kingdom. Meanwhile, Henry's son, Prince Hal, is hanging out with thieves, whores, and drunkards all day long in the Boar's Head Tavern. He's quite the wild and young jokester, but his father scolds him for keeping such friends and wants him to stop giving in to this need to be popular. Hal changes his ways and goes with his father to fight the rebels. There he meets Hotspur in battle and slays him, therefore earning back his father's admiration. Soon after the battle, Henry dies, concluding that heavy is the head that wears the crown, and the heavy burden of being king then passes to Hal. But the cool thing is, he's ready. He vows to be a noble king, and this is the story of how Prince Hal became King Henry V.